it's only voices in your head and dreams you've never dreamt. Hello, welcome to the Blue Boar Tavern again, folks. Come on in. Um, we're brought to you by the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. I always need to mention that. Go look up the website if you're not a regular friend or member. Become a member if you want to. And um, also, if you're not joining us live tonight here on the Blue Board Tavern, but are watching us from the future through the YouTube machine, be sure to hit like and subscribe. Um, it's buttons are at your table there. We've got something different today. Um, it came out of a previous meeting, you maybe probably were at that one, where we were discussing pseudonymity and how the Elizabethan age was the age of synonyms, it's been called, allonyms, frontmen. We discussed all that. And in the course of that, um, it was brought up the work of a longtime good friend of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, Robert Prechter, who's written this, I was going to say book. It's not a book doesn't do it justice. Um, called Oxford's Voices, thousands of pages, year, decades of work. Um, and his premise is that uh, Edward de Vere wasn't just Shakespeare, but he was other writers of the time, uh, Robert Greene, Thomas Nash, um, and he documents this and argues it. So we thought we'd have Bob here on the Blue Board Tavern as a guest to talk more about that. And, um, you know, here at our table, we approach that from different places. Some of our usual gang are really out and out enthusiastic and excited about that. Some are more agnostic, uh, approaching it from, with an open-minded interest, but no firm position. And some, unfortunately, was I was going to take a deep dive into it, but life events interrupted. So I apologize to Bob for not being as adequately prepared as I would have wished, but I dipped my toes in. So I'm going to be in this session, our designated dumb person, um, asking the basic questions and representing those of you who really don't know much about Bob's book. Uh, I think I see people coming in here. I think we'll have Bonner back this week and uh, Brian as well. There's our friend, Brian. Hey Hello, there. Brian. <laughs> Good to see you, Jonathan. Good to see you, Bonner. There's Bonner back after her leave of absence. Good to see you again. I always call Bonner the, the soul of our group. <laughs> Dorothea. Here. Oh, Bonner, welcome back. Thank you. After my sabbatical. <laughs> sabbatical, that's what it was. Okay. Yeah, it's and great think, to see you, Bonner. Uh, good to see y'all. Bob is walking that. outside the window, oh. approaching the door. So he shall be here. Ah, there he is, our guest. Oh, he is. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome Bob. Tavern. Bob. And I was just well, explaining to everyone that others here are more familiar. I'm going to pull back and let some other people take the lead and I'm going to listen and learn. Dorothea, I think you know Bob best. So oh, wow. pass it over to you to well, how um, you all know each other. We spent uh, some of our last session trying to get to know each other better. And we were, one of the questions we asked each other is how did you become an Oxfordian? So Bob, how did you become an Oxfordian? Um, it started pretty early in terms of skepticism, because like most people in my generation, when we read Shakespeare in, in high school, it was the Folger edition of the plays. And at the, in the beginning, there's a discussion of, of you know, Stratford-upon-Avon and who Shakespeare was. So maybe the second play I read, I started getting interested in, in this guy. And I said, you know, I must have missed something. Let me go back and read that intro again. And uh, it just has virtually nothing about the man in it. And I was just so disappointed, even though uh, the, the editor, um, Wright, spent a good three pages denouncing anybody who thought Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. So, you know, I said, well, there isn't much there. <clears throat> and then when I was 18, right after graduating from high school, my best friend and I went over to England, France, bummed around for seven weeks, had a great time. And the first place we wanted to go was Stratford-upon-Avon. As everybody knows who's been there, it took about 15 minutes to say, this is the biggest waste of time. It's obviously just completely manufactured. And I think we left within 15 or 20 minutes. And then after that, it just simmered for a long period of time until Ogburn's book came out. And like many people, I was introduced with that. 
Uh, and one of my favorite things that happened was when Charles Burford uh, did his tour of America. And one of his stops was Atlanta. So I called my mom. I said, Mom, I'm taking you to a lecture. And um, his first slide was the collected works of Will Shakespeare. And it was, of course, the famous six scrawled signatures. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was downhill from there. OK, so at some point in this journey, you began to suspect that Oxford was perhaps more than just one pen name or pseudonym. And how did that happen for you? And then how did that turn into 20 years of work and 6,000 pages of scholarship? That idea had hardly crossed my mind. And I knew that some Oxfordians were already proposing that he might have written um, you know, his, his uncle's uh, famous poems, uh, Metamorphoses, and uh, maybe Romeo and Juliet, that sort of thing. But I, I didn't really think about it at all until I got interested in the late 90s. If you remember, there was a bit of a fad then to see if the uh, dedication to Shakespeare's sonnets had some sort of code in it. And so I said, well, I'm going to take a crack at this. And um, I thought that I had found exactly what was going on. I think it's a puzzle. I later wrote an article, I think it was in 2005, that was in the Shakespeare Oxford newsletter about this. But embedded in there are the names Risley, a very cleverly rendered, um, uh, Philip Herbert, William Herbert, um, Amelia Bassana. And those are big, long names, and they're packed in there. But I said, just to make sure this isn't, you know, uh, just pure luck, I ran all the names in Ogburn's index through the puzzle. And up came some names that I, I wasn't familiar with at the time. And they were Robert Green, uh, Thomas, Thomas Lodge, George Peel, and William Warner. And I thought, I wonder what they're doing there. And I just kind of left it on the back burner for a while until uh, it was either 97 or 98 at one of the conferences and I was watching the stock market like I usually do. So I came down late. People were coming out of a room and they said, I said, well, what was going on? Oh, oh um, we just heard a very exciting talk from Stephanie Hughes. She thinks Robert Greene was a pseudonym of the Earl of Oxford. And that's when I, it just hit me. I said, that's what's in there. Somebody put in what he th thought were his favorite voices, maybe. And that started off. I started to look things up. And um, that was the beginning. So you were doing this in your free time, like, you know, after developing economic theory and <laughs> oh. watching the stock market. I mean, relax. I'm so thankful my wife isn't here right now because she just slapped my, my <laughs> head. Because every weekend, every evening, every holiday, um, that's what I was doing. And I thought initially, oh, I'll be done in a year. This is no big deal. But, you know, you go along and you start realizing if you want to make a case, you can't just say, oh, I think I've found this guy here and there. You also have to contrast it with all the people who were independent. And so you could say, I've really separated them into two groups. And so that actually took quite a few years as well. Yeah, I, I like the fact that your work, it, it, uh, it shows how so many bright people have kind of looked into this over the years. And you generously cite and build upon what, like you mentioned, Stephanie Hopkins Hughes, Nina Green and others. There was, I think there was even a Baconian back in the 1890s who first came up with the idea that Robert Green could be a persona of the true author. They, of course, they thought it was Bacon. And that's interesting that, that so many different people over time have tackled this and have at least as to green and and you know and 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 uh, and your theory builds upon it in such a grand way that it's a uh, it's almost kind of i think intimidating for some people when you really well get you know it. yeah and, and anytime somebody did something before me i, I mentioned it uh, in the book and if they did something after me i mentioned it in the book uh, one of the coolest one was ones was when wagaman wrote an article and he said i think oxford translated the decameron well, I had missed it because it wasn't published until, what, 1620, I think. And I looked it over and I said, the guy's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was published in 87. And there was actually a sort of a space. Um, I think Oxford finished the first four books of William Warner's Albion's England 
in June of 86, right before he got his big stipend. And I think that was one of the impetuses for that, impeti maybe. Um, but uh, I looked at it and I realized there was a pretty good gap right there. So I think he spent the second half of 1586 translating the Decameron. So uh, just to zoom back out, like I guess uh, traditional Stratfordian theory holds that you know, the Stratford man, I guess, like kind of rolled out of bed when he was in his early 20s. And then I guess wrote Venus and Adonis. And then he kind of wrote a series of these amazing plays. And that's we don't have, you know, we have those two poems, but mostly he just wrote plays, but also two poems. And that's kind of the whole canon. So I'm curious as to, you know, how that had that struck you as you were, uh, you know, doing your work in terms of what would be representative of an artist throughout their career. Well, yeah, the great thing about all, every, all the work Oxfordians have done, it was that was the Rosetta Stone. I mean, when it comes to stylistic things and interests and topics and themes, uh, all the voices had to match. Um, that's one of the few things stylistically that had to happen. They had to have the same ideas as Shakespeare, and they had to have you know similar practices. Um, and if they deviated from that, it was the first big red flag that I wasn't dealing with a voice. There are many, many things. I, I actually have a list at the beginning of the book of 91 traits of the voice's writing. And um, uh, there are also things they did not do. Now, some things they did, for example, uh, that I don't know that anybody's really talked about, they often wrote as if they had a thesaurus with them. I think he either had one on a Rolodex or in his head, and so when he was writing a poem where somebody was uh, sad, he would use every word in the book, cry, moan, weep, wail, woe, grieve, grief, grieving. And he used, you know, the noun and verb version and the gerund and everything else. And I found that to be a, a really good sign. Um, of course, uh, most of the voices are not devout. But on occasion, he writes a rip-roaring Calvinist tract. And I think we, we know the reason for that, because he thought um, preachers were dunces. And mostly he berates them, or one of the voices berates them for not understanding rhetoric. And he was basically saying, look, here's how you do it. So you would see that as well. Of course, he always cared about birth status. That sneaks in a lot. He never writes about the middle class. And things that would tell me very quickly I was probably not dealing with the voice is if they wrote in tetrameter or trimeter, especially hexameter. He hated hexameter. I think he wrote one thing and it was a parody. Um, things written, the poems written in rhymed couplets. He rarely did anything long that was in rhymed couplets. Marlowe used them, for example, and you can tell them apart from that. Um, and jam is, is huge, um, especially in the canon of Samuel Daniel. That's one of the split canons, which is a little bit difficult when you get a split canon. But Daniel was absolutely addicted to enjambit, and that's where you don't end your thought with the line. Now, Shakespeare does it all the time. Just take a look at the first uh, stanza of Venus and Adonis, the first uh, sonnet among the Shakespeare sonnets, and you'll see that the line for him is actually a, a constraint on the poetry and, and the uh, thoughts that he's putting into it, but not Samuel Daniel and, and not, for, for example, Arthur Golding. But Daniel would say, you know, his, his line would go, um, today I left and I went to the store and I, and then it goes to the next line, bought some cigarettes. You know, uh, Shakespeare and, and the voices virtually never do that. Another thing they don't do is they don't turn prose, pretend that prose is verse. Arthur Golding was just awful at that. So you look at these lines and they look like a iambic pentameter, but it's really just prose and he would just stop, you know, at the end of the line. And if you write it out in prose, you, you can't tell where the line endings are. Yeah, so, so it's a rhythm almost um, to the way Oxford's words fall on the page, at least to me. And I love the way you use the word voices. It's got a lot packed into that word, but you can almost hear him through mm -hmm. these other pen names, Alan M's, whichever he's chosen, it's a yeah. musicality to it. I, there, I there is, but when I started, I mean, I was not good at that music and I didn't use that in any way. But as the years went by, when I got into the 15th or, or year or 20th year, 
Uh, you could often tell a voice because it was a freaking roller coaster. I mean, you're in this this uh, narrative poem or, or a play, and you're not sure maybe if, if somebody else is writing it. But when you get into the final pages and the final uh, two acts, the acceleration just begins to zoom, and you're reading along, and you can and you can hardly hold yourself back from racing forward. Whereas most of the poets at the time, you are just struggling to get through the stanza, wondering what in the world are they trying to say? And he was a genius at that, although I have to say that really didn't figure into uh, my decision making very often. It was it was usually not stylistic stuff. It was a whole host of other things. And you mentioned um, uh, Arthur Golding, who obviously was Oxford's uncle. He was living with him when he was young. So I'm interested in connecting the dots um, like between kind of the juvenilia and what Oxford was doing, you know, when he was a kid, basically up until the time that he starts writing these uh, complete plays that we have under the Shakespeare uh, heading. Well, I think the first thing that he wrote for publication was a song lyric. And he put it out under the name W.E. So, of course, all the scholars rush to their listed names and they say, oh, this must be William Elderton. Well, I, I read this poem. It's a very pretty song lyric. Uh, it mentions classical gods and goddesses and love and this and that sort of thing. And I thought, well, you know, maybe William Elderton could have written it until you keep reading in the William Elderton canon. And when William Elderton put out a song, he didn't put his initials on it. He put his whole name on it. William Elderton, very proud. And it didn't happen until seven years later that he decided he could write songs too and get them published. And they are God awful. They're just terrible little ditties and silly, uh, silly language and, and uh, nonsense syllables and things like that. And it just struck me. I wonder how someone could think that the same person wrote both of those. Uh, also, when he was 10 years old, or just about 10 years old, he wrote uh, Ovid's Fable of Narcissus. Um, and he put it out under the initials TH. He was big in initials. The printer happened to be Thomas Hackett. I think that's the name he was probably trying to copy with the initials. But it was the first big thing that was pulled directly um, from Ovid's work. And uh, he went on from there. One interesting thing about the early years from 1560 to 1579, is Oxford actually wrote most of his poems in um, 14ers or Poulter's measure. And he didn't really lock on to iambic uh, pentameter until about 7980. I mean, he was using it sometimes, but mostly it was that, you know, da 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 you know. The hallmark card rhythm. Yeah. A peas porridge hot sort of thing. Yeah. And yeah. you can see, you know, he was a genius and, and he realized that if you have tetrameter or trimeter, there's always a sort of a song feeling to it, a, a, a frivolous song feeling, like you said, greeting card. But I, iambic pentameter, when you have start with a five, it's like a song in five, four, you know, like take five or something. It just throws you off. It's not like a song. So, okay, so you you talked about alonyms. You just mentioned a couple of alonyms that he was using. So can you illustrate what the alonym theory is in terms of yeah. Oxford's voices and what he's yeah. doing? Yeah, now, so, you know, some people uh, have said, well, you know, I, I, I understand that this is, uh, you know, Brechter thinks that he wrote under alonyms, which is names of real people as opposed to pseudonyms. Now, he did use some pseudonyms, uh, but if you think about it, there's a really good reason why you would use um, alonyms instead of pseudonyms if you wanted to have your work um, uh, believed to be by other people. Now, we already know that Oxford was doing that because he put out these wonderful plays and he did everything he could to have the world think somebody else wrote them. And the way he did that was to find somebody finally, I think in about 1596, who could be a stand in for that name. Um, but he was actually using alonyms from most from the very start, from the very beginning. In fact, uh, I want to read you something uh, if I have it here that I think, in his words, explains what he was doing. And just so you know, from the way I interpret it, I think what he was trying to do 
was glorify Elizabeth's reign and make it appear to the world as if it had as many amazing playwrights and poets and storytellers as ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and Renaissance Italy. So here's a passage. It's in the, um, the uh, preface to Samuel Daniel's Cleopatra. Oxford wrote that play, and he's writing a preface to um, the Countess, Mary Sidney. And he starts with, oh, that the ocean did not bound our style. And this is another thing, by the way, lines beginning with, oh, absolutely huge. The <laughs> voices love that. Oh, that the ocean did not bound our style within these strict and narrow limits so, but that the melody of our sweet isle might now be heard to Tiber, Arne, and Po. Those are rivers in Italy. That they might know how far Thames doth outgo the music of declined Italy. Oh, why may not some after coming hand unlock these limits, open our confines, and teach to Rhine, to Loire, to Rhone, our accents, and the wonders of our land, that they might all admire and honor us, whereby great Sydney and our Spencer might, just a little parenthetical point here, those are two real poets. And the voices loved Spencer above everybody because he was the only poet who was anywhere near Oxford in, in uh, ability. And of course, he's talking to Mary Sidney, so he's going to definitely list Philip Sidney as part of that. He was completely independent as well, so he's naming two independent poets. Whereby great Sidney and our Spencer might, with those post singers being equaled, enchant the world with such a sweet delight that their eternal songs forever read may show what great Eliza's reign hath bred. And I think that's what he was trying to do. It's interesting that's how... Good, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's oh. a good answer, because approaching this fresh, I knew one of my questions was, well, why would Oxford do that? And you've just spelled that out for me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a big question. And of course, we have to ask that even with Shakespeare. You know, why would he do it? Now, people have had a lot of theories, but I think that's the real reason. Yeah, motivation think, is always so crucial. That's always a crucial question. It was great patriotism. I mean, oh. I loved his country. Phenomenal patriotism. Dorothea, that is another one of the traits. Um, he yeah. was pro-England, no matter who the voice was. Um, there, if there was, it was either neutral or or very pro-England. I've got a whole section in the back where I say, you know. These voices are equal to each other. And I have passages from maybe 10 or 12 on each topic. And one of them is that it's the glory of England and the patriotism. And there's about seven or eight of these wonderful, you know, peons to England. And they're just so fun to read one after another. And each one's attached to a different name. Yeah. Stepping back and looking at it, it struck me when I was hearing, you know, Phoebe and Bob talking that, uh, it's it's in, impressive, Bob, that a lot of what your study is looked at is not just Oxford's voices, but the independent voices too. And so you you've obviously devoted a lot of serious thought to you know who who were the the other great poets and writers of the time who were not voices. And so the one kind of an easy knee jerk criticism of your work is well, he thinks everybody you know he thinks Oxford is writing for everybody, but obviously there were some very interesting people at the time who were the you know, competitors or the fellow writers and influenced each other. And I know with Mar when I first dived into it about two years ago, I haven't, I, you know, I, I keep coming back to it and it's such a vast, um, it's such a vast thing you've put together. But I looked at the section on Marlowe and you, you argue Marlowe is basically an independent writer, but you offered this idea that perhaps Edward II was a, a posthumous work, posthumous to Marlowe, where Oxford was using Marlowe as a voice. And and I, I was approaching the whole thing very skeptically, but I found it surprisingly plausible, even for me quite persuasive, to think of Edward II as a as a voice under Marlowe. And uh, and yet basically you're saying Marlowe is mainly an independent writer. And so that's that's it fascinating to know that. And I think people maybe that's one way that people maybe could gain access to this and look at that is is to say that you know you're you're not claiming everybody was a puppet of of Oxford that uh, what was the role of these other writers like Spencer and Sidney and Marlowe for the most part and others on to the the point that Brian's making you come up with 150 voices 
And yet you must have looked at the work of far more than 150 yeah. writers. Yeah. And what do you, I mean, to compare them and decide that's not it. What do you think the number was of the total number of, of individuals whose work you studied? Well, okay. So there, I think there are 150, just over 150 voices. And somebody said, oh, that's crazy. It's too many. It's not really. He was writing for over 45 years. Uh, that's only three three per year. So every three three to four months, you know, he would he would finish something and say, you know, who can I attribute this to? And he would find somebody on the college rolls or somebody who lived nearby or or, or a friend or or something like that, and he would slap their name on it. So uh, and you also have to realize many of these are one offs. Uh, Samuel Brandon writes a play and you never never hear from him again. Uh, Thomas Hughes writes a play and you never hear from him again. Uh, Mary Sidney writes one play and she never writes another play. Um, E.C. writes The Tragedy of Miriam, uh, Queen of the Jews, which is a very Shakespearean play. Never never hear from, the, from that person again. And then there are the pamphlet years of 1589 to 1591, where he's doing battle with people. He's battling Martin Marperley and he's battling the Harvey brothers. And he doesn't and he starts using pseudonyms and they're crazy pseudonyms. So it's obvious they are pseudonyms. You know, it's Robin Goodfellow and Adam Fowlweather and Simon Smellnave and Double V and names like that. And I thought about it, you know, I wonder why he's doing this. And I realized, oh, he really didn't want to slap some poor citizen with attacking other people. So he did it under under pseudonyms instead. But the point point is. He could. He probably wrote those particular pamphlets in two days apiece, and so you can rack up quite a few voices in a short period of time when all all the voice is done as a single pamphlet. Yeah. But um, I might I might have missed it. But did, did you? I mean, there's we we have a modern writer Fernando Pessoa, you know, who's yeah. a Portuguese writer who apparently came up with dozens of pseudonyms. So we we have we do have other examples of this or something similar. Have you? dived into that a little bit in a comparative sense like who else did this and where where else have we seen something oh that was going to be one of mine too is yeah i always think of charlton ogburn wrote one time the phenomenon in nature that is unique doesn't exist so uh, my yeah. question then approaching this fresh is like okay well who else has done this that well we can i don't think use anybody it? else but yeah alex alex Medial turned me on to pessoa and he actually created personas and he, they mm -hmm. even wrote in different handwritings and so forth. And I think Oxford had uh, three major personas, Robert Greene, um, Thomas Nash, and George Peel. But um, I, I would answer the question really differently, which is, uh -huh. we already know Oxford was unique. How many other people do any of us know who wrote a massive body of wonderfully amazing work and did everything he could to make sure somebody else got the credit? That's a crazy, that's steep to think about. Yeah. Um, he was unique. And and what we were just finding out, or I think we're finding out here, is that he started from the earliest day that he got something published. He put it in other people's names. He did it the whole time. Whether he had his big vision at, at the start, I don't know. It could have been that, you know, that, that um, sort of ban against noble people being poets and playwrights and stuff. So he might have been done it for that reason to start with, because he was he was way high up in the social hierarchy and he probably wanted to remain anonymous. But then I think he said, oh, this is my calling, you know? Okay, I think that answers a question I was just passed that ties into this. Uh, Brian said, would he have used glorifying Elizabeth as a reason for elonyms from the start? But I think you've just said, no, maybe another reason, but it went into that. I, I just want to speak just in terms of the like, I think part of why like the Oxford's voices theory has a lot of contemporary resonance is like when I first started reading your work, it immediately made sense to me because everybody that I know has 10 different online personae. Um, you know, you have one, which is your anonymous shit poster, you know, handle when you want to say offensive stuff about the government. I have a friend who has a TikTok channel where she does tarot readings and then another TikTok channel where she does like lifestyle, like come with me on my vacation stuff. And then another one where she like complains about politics. You know, everybody like I think this idea of a, you know, in an obviously politically repressive society where there's this kind of we know that the Elizabethan period was the kind of golden age of, of cryptography and um, 
yeah, I don't know. It just immediately made sense to me, this idea of all these sock puppets, you know, rushed like bots, you know, that you would have maybe for a government purpose to try and manufacture consent and make it seem like, oh, the man on the street saying this and that, like it immediately made sense to me as something that would that it was just it clicked. I don't know. And it's also, I mean, one of the most repressive societies, um, certainly one in which the government um, lopped off hands and tortured people and put them on the rack and put them in prison. But if you don't have a body, if you're incorporeal, it's very difficult to find you. Oxford was in a unique position because of his social status. He he could get away with numerous things other people couldn't do. And people, you know, Oxfordians have already figured out he's probably lampooning some people on stage. Um, but uh, as uh, Bonner recently let me know, um, Whitgift um, authorized only four um, secular works. All four of them are by the Earl of Oxford. You know, Venus and Adonis, Two Things by Nash, and the Decameron. Uh, so, yeah. He, and, and when he for, was... For those angry, that don't know, that's Arch Archbishop Whitgift, yes. right? Is he, was he the Archbishop of Canterbury? Mm -hmm. or? He's the Archbishop of Canterbury and the very mm -hmm. highest ranking uh, human being in the Church of England. And furthermore, mm -hmm. Queen Elizabeth put him on her, her privy council about three years after she made him the Archbishop. So what the, a point that, that Bob made that really hit home with me is because uh, I had put a lot of stock in Thomas Nash being at, at Whit Gifts uh, Summer Palace of Croydon and writing the, the uh, Summer's Last Will and Testament, and that was entertainment there. And Bob de uh, deconstructed that very, very well. <laughs> For taking the evidence and deconstructing it is, I, I, and, and I was for it. And I've kind of had a few little epiphanies along the way, Bob, with what you've done, because you've had such a, such a very straightforward and very um, clear-minded, clear view of, of evidence. And you're not a lawyer. <laughs> We've got lawyers here that, that could we do have that too. Of it's really... We have plenty of lawyers here in the bar. You know, we're yeah. two... <laughs> lawyers, so... two is too many. Yeah. You could, you, could, you could have been a great lawyer, Bob, I think. Uh, oh, <laughs> probably probably just but, as well you I, didn't get sucked down into the you, legal. You <laughs> Everybody in my graduating class was either a lawyer, a doctor, or an educator. And uh, I wasn't. <laughs> Not well, I, I just want to add, too, as I've been reading it, the only part I've read so far is I've read your, your work on Thomas Nash. And I can hardly wait to get to more of the voices. But I've started with Nash because, as we know, in Diana Price's wonderful book and the chart that just drives Stratfordian is crazy with that chart, which he shows that uh, how much evidence they have for other people. And, of course, uh, Ben Johnson is batting a thousand. They have evidence for him in all 10 categories. The next, though, for evidence is Thomas Nash on this chart. And I had to enjoy what you had said. Did I have my, uh, I need my glasses somewhere, but that's okay. You said that you, when you go what the evidence is, you said it is, it, it's good evidence only if one does not study it carefully. <laughs> so good. Well, and then you can proceed to deconstruct it. Yeah. When I did that PowerPoint on Nash, it, I mean, it took me a year to put that together because I wanted to make sure I didn't have anything in there that somebody could say, yeah, but, you know, so, uh, I said, we have to explain every single piece of literary evidence that suggests he was real, and every piece of documentary evidence that suggests he was real. And the further I got into him, the more I realized virtually every one of them is not merely dismissible, it's actually evidence for the contrary. And that's what's so fun, I think, about Nash. Because another thing is, everybody loves Thomas Nash. He, he's probably had more biographers than any of the voices. And just because, you know, he was a curmudgeon. People love these people after they're dead. You know, they don't like them when they're alive, but after they oh, they just love these guys. So they were sure that he was an independent person. And that was part of Oxford's genius that he could create, like Pessoa, a, a persona like Robert Greene uh, or Thomas Nash. Most of the time, he didn't do that. He just put stuff out in somebody's name. But in this case, I actually think that he posed as Robert Greene sometimes, as uh, George Peel, sometimes he collected a payment when he put on Dido for the for Count Lasky, which Hamlet talks about. Um, and he also wrote a letter to his father-in-law saying, my eldest daughter is going to deliver it to you. And of course, that was Elizabeth, uh, his daughter. Uh, and I think he poses Thomas Nash. And, and I think we know that because 
he had to have been at Croydon in late 92, writing Summer's Last Will. He was a guest of the Archbishop. And if you read the biography of Thomas Nash, the way even his own champions describe him as like a ragamuffin, he'd only written two pamphlets at that time. The Archbishop never would have brought him to Croydon, simply from his status, but also because he didn't have any any uh, history of writing plays. So Oxford's there, and Whitgift is annoyed at one of his churchmen. And the churchman has these crazy theories. And uh, so Oxford joins in in uh, sort of turning this guy into a goat, apparently. So he writes to Oxford's father-in-law. They never write the censors and say, um, I'm annoyed about this writer. They write Oxford's father-in-law. And he said, I I'm annoyed at uh, Whitgift's Nash gentleman. And he said it in such a way that I think you know, he knew who he was talking about. Burley knew who he was talking about. But I think because he used that phrase, we know that Oxford was there. And he said, yeah, you know, today I'm Thomas Nash. Humor me. That's. I was interested in um, kind of a, a consistent thread throughout uh, your book about like uh, these very th kind of threadbare biographies. Like one of my favorite like points voices was a guy who seems to only write elegies, like his whole career is he like the only stuff that ever publishes out of his name is like a handful of elegies. And I was like, wow, either, you know, this guy must've sucked at parties. <laughs> he's, he's a, a true for, for specialist. <laughs> but then he, he, he writes some amazing things and disappears. Yeah. Yeah. Or you know, somebody who, again, has no qualifications, comes out of nowhere, writes one masterpiece play that scholars say that Shakespeare perjured from and stole large sections verbatim from. And then you never hear from this supposedly like amazing one hit wonder, as somebody in the comments put again. Um, and I think you were piecing together almost like a almost like a kind of a literate, like a CV for Oxford by looking finally like the missing gap between his like EO song lyrics, the juvenilia and then the mature yeah. words. By what? reading work, I almost started to think of Shakespeare as like, you know, because a lot of that canon was constructed posthumously as almost like a greatest hits collection put together by, you know, fans, descendants, curators. Um, you know, one, one thing that... Um was helpful is when I started to arrange things by genre. <clears throat> and you can start to see trajectories. For example, um, John Lilly comes out, he writes two novels. They're a big hit. Then he stops. It was 1578, 1579. What happens in 1580? Robert Green comes out and writes his first novel. And then he goes on for a while and he's writing other things. And near the end of his career, he starts writing satires like Quip for an Upstart Courtier. Then he has a religious conversion, and suddenly there's Thomas Nash, and he's writing satires. So he sort of picks up the ball from Robert Greene. Um, Robert Greene also wrote about six plays, and they're all you know good plays. But the last one, James the Fourth, uh, virtually every scholar says this is a Shakespeare play. Um, Shakespeare learned from Robert Greene, and his last play was so good that Shakespeare just borrowed the style and, and ran with it. And of course, we can see the trajectory because that's when Oxford was, you know, polishing his, his favorite ones and made them even better. Um, Green promises something called a, a black book. I'm going to come out with a black book. Well, he, uh, he kills off Green too early before the black book comes out. And a couple of years later, out comes Thomas Nash with Terrors of the Night. And it's the same sort of theme that he was promising in Black Book. So you can see the overlaps when you when you lay them out in that way. And it's it's uh, starts becoming a narrative. But just to be clear, so it was and I, I didn't I, I dove more into the Robert Greene angle and I've gotten very fascinated by Robert Greene. And I finding your theory, uh, w w regardless of how much the rest of it um may rise or fall I, it seems very plausible to me that robert green was a voice because it's just he's really weird i mean it's just the whole thing about green's death and what he wrote it just doesn't he's not a and real writing, person and but, writing from beyond the grave Brian. yeah, yeah, yeah so right right well, yeah there's just so much weird That's stuff like and, the big he dies from a surfeit of pickled herring and rhenish wine yeah, the pickled herring that's a, that's from a, beyond the grave do you think he's real if the pickled herring is not a red herring, but but so on on Nash, though, since I I didn't read I unlike Bonner, I didn't dive into the Nash angle. Do you do, you, do you, is Nash a complete pseudonym, or or was there? Do you think there was a real person, Thomas Nash, or was he a complete invention? I think he borrowed the name. Gabriel Harvey tells us where it came from. 
He said, I have never heard of this Thomas Nash. He said, the only Thomas Nash I know was our butler of Pembroke Hall. So there was a butler at Pembroke Hall, Cambridge, who was named Thomas Nash. And I think Oxford, of course, was there. He knew him. And he probably thought, that's a good name for somebody who's going to be doing some biting satire, you know? So Nash was there a guy? Nash. Yeah, but there was not a stand-in. See, he just borrowed the name pretty much out of thin air. Not not a writer, in other words. But in Green, right. do you think it was Green? Because there, there's, a, there's a few intriguing biographical items about yeah. Green, like, you know, the, the yeah. preface to Mamilia is there in which any connects to there's some evidence about green being a student and getting a master's degree at cambridge and then in green uh he dedicates i think it's planet planetomachia to lester of all people reputed to be oxford's great nemesis and and, Lester, and then there's a record in lester's own account books that that lester gives him five pounds gives some guy named robert green five pounds the very same year so what's what's going on with that? I'm just intrigued. Yeah, those are that. pieces of evidence that that uh, point to the idea that Robert Greene was real. But again, let's let's take a look at it. What Robert Greene says in the beginning of Amelia, he says, "I was I was at Clare Hall." So of course the intrepid researchers rush over to the to the university. They look in the records like, "Oh, look at this! Uh, somebody named Robert Greene got an MA degree at, at Clare Hall." Well, there we go. We're done. Well, some other people said. Okay, well, let's see what else we can find at Cambridge about Robert Greene. And as Dorothea turned me on to one guy who did the work, uh, they fa found out that, guess what? Robert Greene has no records anywhere through the whole thing. They have dining hall records. They can tell you the exact weeks that Christopher Marlowe was at Cambridge. And apparently Robert Greene never ate a meal in the dining hall at okay. all the years really? of his is that, yeah. so we, we have dining hall records for Cambridge. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he was, yeah. he's, he's an insubstantial. I mean, I think with green, I mean, there yeah. in French is green. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, so that that's kind of an easy one. But I think the thing about green that's so fun is when you look at Wikipedia or any writers, um, Stratfordians who, you know, believe that Green is a real human being, they always get stuck on the Norwich. You know, he tells us in his last book, he was born in Norwich. Oh, there are two Greens in Norwich, but none of them had a son named Robert. And I've had this thought, which is Oxford in a panic going, oh, my God, I have to find a body. So, you know, what does he do? Does he write these letters? He finds, a you know, two Green families in Norwich and goes, fabulous. I'll stash him in there in the last book before I kill him off. Because, you know, what are you going to do? You you have well, to. Green, green is a really common name. I mean, there are greens probably in every Yeah, it's a really England. common name. I mean, but, like, and isn't there, but, isn't there, a, you said there was like a, a dwarf who was in the, the records as a performing, like dwarf who, who performed at court. Yeah, they found several rock greens, including a, a court jester, a dwarf court jester. I would not try to connect any of that uh, but I mean, one could imagine that he thought that would be pretty funny to name his his his, his guy after that. And but let, let's there, there's to... there's so many greens. It's like it's like the perfect outings that it's like hiding in plain sight. There's so many Robert Greens or Greens that it's like you can't you can't pick any particular one. <laughs> just one, right. one question exactly. came up here. Oh, sorry, Bob. Can I just throw this out? Somebody asked you in your book, do you have a timeline of the voices, like laid out uh, over? The decades. Logical yeah. order. The narrative poems that I think he wrote, the plays I think he wrote, all the prose stories I think he wrote, all the pamphlets, uh, and, and they're in order. Um, but there's not a timeline for every single piece in order. And part of it is because very often you only have the year. And you're not necessarily 100% sure, you know, which calendar is involved. So I thought that was the best way to do it. But if we could just for a second, I want to backtrack to Mamilia for a second, because, okay, so Mamilia, he says, go look in Clear Hall and you'll find some evidence. Thomas Nash does the same thing. He says, he, he takes a trip to uh, up the coast. He comes back and he tells everybody, I was born in Lowstoft. Well, so... The intrepid researchers go up to Lowstoff and they find a parish record. Sure enough, there's a Thomas Nash 
actually Naish, N-A-Y-S-H-E, who was born, born in Lowstoff. But again, the problem was he didn't go any further than that. If you look around Lowstoff, there is zero evidence that any Thomas Nash was ever there. And there's there's no history that he had a, a pre-university education or anything. So he picks one thing that he thinks will satisfy anybody who's looking for him. But here's the other cool thing about it, Mamelia. Do you know who it's uh, dedicated to? Oh, Lord right, Darcy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, who's, the Oxford, who's Lord Darcy? Oxford connection? Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, who is that? Well, it's John Darcy, who's the son of Oxford's Aunt Lizzie. You know, his father's sister was Elizabeth Vere. She married uh, Thomas Darcy, his son with John. He's older than Oxford, so it was his elder cousin. So, uh, okay, so that's a pretty good connection. But then um, Darcy dies a few months later. And Oxford writes a letter to Burley, and he's talking about a kinsman who recently died, and he wants Burley to help out his daughter's husband, Lord Lumley. And um, he said, yeah, my kinsman that I just lost, I was very beholden to. And you read Robert Greene's dedication to him, and he says, I, I, am, I, I owe you a lot. You know, I'm in your debt. It's the exact same thing, same guy, and we can connect it to Earl of Oxford. And you don't need, for example, stylistic stuff when you find uh, so many connections that are biographical. Um, and of course, the Nash canon is absolutely crammed with concerns that, uh, that the Earl of Oxford has. But what Nash about the Lester, is- sorry, but on the, the, the dedication to Lester and uh, and the Lester paying someone named Robert Green, was he, was Oxford punking Oxford. Lester there? Was that like a prank or something? That's intriguing you know, to me. Uh, it, it happened twice. Um, the Earl of Northumberland tipped George Peel three pounds. He had a servant or a household, you know, guy keeping the books, send someone named Mr. Warner to give the three pounds to George Peel. I I have no clever um, glib explanation for that. You know, we can all come up with possible scenarios. You know, uh, he was just playing a role and to partly play that role, he wanted to to uh, get paid, or maybe these guys just did it on their own because they were thanking um, Oxford as Peel for writing, I think it was Honor of the Garter, because the Earl of Northumberland had just been named Knight of the Garter. And so Oxford wrote a poem about that. Somehow he ended up with an extra three pounds. If you can come up with an explanation, that's one of the very few things in the book where I say, you know what, it's a fact, uh, but I'm so, all the evidence is so overwhelming that I'm not going to claim that means there's a, a separate guy. And in each case, I think there was an intermediary involved. Um, so we're not exactly sure who showed up to get the money from Lester. And you mentioned that they were supposed to be nemeses, um, especially when Oxford was young. Several voices dedicated books to him. And then Robert Greene dedicated a book to him. He didn't express his upset with Lester. And remember, Lester had a chokehold on his entire estate until he was 21 years old. So he had to be nice to this guy. Um, And it was only, it wasn't until Thomas Nash uh, wrote an animal allegory that we find out that Oxford had harbored a lot of bitter thoughts about what Lester Lester had done to his cousin, the Duke of Norfolk. Mm. So Bob, you know, once we, um, once we go down the path and we we kind of realize that Nash and Green and Oxford and Shakespeare are all the same guy, can't we begin to completely destroy so much of the Stratfordian theory? I mean, the upstart crow self-immolates uh, feathers <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> right? Because yeah. it's Green writing about the next voice, right? Well, he's writing about Edward Elaine, anyway. So that kind of that that. Has well, already been or is he up, writing about the Shakespeare scene to come, right? Or is he writing about Shakespeare, who's about to come on the scene? The red cloth that the Stratfordians hold out. No, Shakespeare got that red cloth. You know, it falls into the same category through an intermediate area for me as the three pounds. You know, yes, Shakespeare uh, got the, got the red cloth. You know, you use the name for the convenience. How far does it go, Bob? Well, I actually have signed on. Other people have decided it was Edward Allen. I think they made a great, great case because 
there's actually records showing that Edward Allen interlineated a bunch of lines in, into plays, and Green is grousing about someone who did exactly that. So I think that's that's uh, pretty good. But yeah, I mean, there was no Shakespeare. So it's just a waste. Of, and Shakespeare, think about it. Here's a guy who invented a term, Shakespeare, uh, and, and now he's using almost the same thing, Shakespeare. He just invented a second similar pseudonym, like Cuthbert Curry Knave and uh, Simon Smell Knave. I mean, they're very similar. And, and Shake, and shake is even more generic. Shake, shake scene is actually pretty pretty generic. A shake is like shakedown, shake bag, shake rag. So it's not even that distinctive, actually. And, you know, it, it renders up a visual thing of this guy bombastically, you know, shaking the stage. I just have a qu question or two here that people have put that seems to tie into this section we're on now. Uh, somebody, Tom, says, would you be willing to expand a bit on that most interesting comment from, it was quite a while ago now, that Oxford sought and in 96 found a suitable name person to attribute the Shakespeare works to. And I don't know if this is related. Somebody asks, okay, we've got, that's a great simplification of motivation, his patriotism, but do you think, what do you think is his personal, where, where do you think his personal motivations were the strongest? So I wonder if those tie together, like where the Shakespeare works more personal. His, his MO was to, Put other people's names on works and on occasion he would play the role and i said robert green uh, thomas nash george peel i think william shakespeare was one of those and some things came out under the initials ws as far back as 1577 i think there's something oxford did that has ws attached uh, ws is attached to some things he didn't write as well but I sort of got the impression that he had been using the name William Shakespeare for a long time, but not nothing came out in that name. So I think he probably used it as a stage name if he were an actor. And I think there's a pretty good probability that he was. So for whatever reason, in 1593, he decides to actually use that name on a publication for the first time. And um, I think when he... He decided he wanted to put out plays. He said, I can use this name. And that's probably around the time he ran into this guy, Will Shakespeare, who was, you know, a hangers on around the uh, around the playhouses. Who knows what he was doing, selling souvenirs, you know, doing bear baiting or, or something like that. And so he he caught, comes up with this idea that he could he could have a front man for this, the dumb man. And um, so I think it's the only instance where he had a pseudonym that became an Alanin. But I, I'm mostly guessing. And if you look at all the evidence, you know, that was going going on in 1596, I think I felt I narrowed it down to within a half a year when he probably did the deal. And then I would think it's 1597 is when he starts trying to get a coat of arms or something like that. So there, there's some, or he, start, he starts buying property uh, back back home for expensive amounts of money. So those are the kind of thing that makes me think he suddenly came into money, and that's yeah. probably a good reason. Um, I guess I'm, you know, I think the obvious, like I'm, I'm Jonathan, I'm, I'm ruminating on what you, the quote that you brought in about, you know, there's no anomalies, and obviously the R English Terence comparison of the kind of aristocrat with the real life front man, like applies here. Um, yeah. I'm also curious about, you know, different modes that he wrote in, like, I think, you know, responding to this thing of, of what was, was his heart in more or less. Like, I think it seems like from your book, he's, he's called on or he's making money to kind of, you know, do the Mar Marvin Marprelate, Martin Marprelate thing where he's doing these kind of political propaganda things, which I think you say sometimes he's, when he's not, he, he doesn't like really doing the devout shtick. It doesn't really speak to his heart. Whereas, his poetry is is obviously that that's kind of more in keeping with what he cares about. Yeah, um, you learn a lot about this guy, I think, from the voices that we didn't or we weren't sure about before. Uh, he had met Whitgift back in 1564 or earlier when Whitgift was a professor of divinity at Cambridge and Oxford was probably the most brilliant student there. They got to know each other. So he helps him out with Martin Marprelate and, and uh, Archbishop helps him out by by. Uh, you know, authorizing these these different uh, secular pieces. He also helps him out when he bans Nash's and Harvey's books because uh, 
Harvey was banned, but Oxford wasn't, <laughs> which is kind of funny because he could invent a new voice and, and go after Harvey again if he felt like it. And of course, he publishes Summer's Last Will in 1600, the year after the ban, and nobody stops him. Uh, but, you know, there are things that we learn about him that I think are kind of cool. For example, he wrote a book called Discovery of Witchcraft. It comes out under the name of Reginald Scott. And when I first came across this, I almost didn't read it because I said, this isn't the kind of thing that he would write. And then I started reading it and I realized, oh, this is our guy. And of course, Reginald Scott wrote one thing, this brilliant, uh, well-researched uh, book about uh, witchcraft and, um, <clears throat> and then disappears like everybody else or, or a lot of them anyway. And what we find out here is that Contrary to what Nelson would have us believe, <laughs> Oxford was not a devotee of the occult. This is a completely humanist book. He's, he's entreating people to stop prosecuting and persecuting demented old ladies. He said, this is a psychological problem. It's not a supernatural problem. They're not doing anything to hurt anybody, but we are hurting them. Please stop. Um, I also think we find out why Oxford wasn't on the Privy Council, which is kind of cool. Um, the implication in my mind, and therefore I assume just about everybody's, was that something like Elizabeth didn't trust him well enough to put him on the Privy Council. But a guy named Beale complains to, again, to uh, Lord Burley, not the censors, about one of Nash's books. He doesn't name the author, he names the book, because Nash was complaining about Danes and this guy didn't like it. And uh, so somehow, magically, Thomas Nash gets hold of the letter and he starts complaining about somebody who complained about him. A privy council member, okay, who sent it to the Lord Treasurer of England and somehow Thomas Nash is hiding in a garret in, in the red light district got a hold of it. So he starts saying, you know, this guy's an idiot. He, he really annoys me. He calls him an infant squib which only somebody as lofty as, as the Earl, I think, could have pulled that off. And then he calls him a mere statesman. And I thought, this tells us exactly what the Earl of Oxford thought about people on the Privy Council. These people are there to advise the government. I'm not a government advisor. I am part of the government. These people are beneath me. I think he would not have accepted a position on the Privy Council. And uh, I think, Bonner, you're the one who pretty much confirmed that he was never on the Privy Council, and I think that's why. A quick, quick question, and I think somebody else is kind of thinking about that. With Reginald Scott's book, that's a one-off, and, uh, and it's anti-demonology, how similar is that to Nash's Terror of the Night, which is another anti-demonology type skeptical of the trying to discourage? Is that because they're both voices? Yeah, and it's about dreams, and it's about uh, scary dreams. I have no idea what motivated him to write that book, really. I, I think there were some things <laughs> about people that he uh, was staying with at the time, and some of them were telling him about their dreams and asking him what they meant. And so he decided this would be a kind of a good theme. It's not exactly a, a you know a horror story, but it's something to keep you up at night. Uh, and who knows exactly there aren't there aren't many things like that now thomas lodge late in his career followed the same path as these other voices you know robert green is writing these love stories and suddenly he has a religious conversion uh thomas Nash in, in 1592 thomas nash is writing satires suddenly he has a religious conversion in 1593 and he has a second edition in 1594 thomas lodge is going along he's writing shakespearean sonnets he's writing uh Euphuie's books, Euphuie's Shadow, Taking the Ball from Lily. He's writing uh, Rosaline, which, of course, uh, is the uh, prose version of As You Like It. And suddenly he's writing religious books in 1596. So there's one after the other. Is He's taking a voice and saying, OK, I, I want to write some of these things. And he's tossing them to one voice. He's tossing them to another. And he's tossing them to the other. And, you know, if you think about it, does that make more sense than having three people suddenly you know, have a complete change of heart about what they've been writing separately and independently. So again, these are these threads that start tying everything together. Bob, to kind of follow on the thread of these religious conversions, um, I you talked a little bit about um, 
well, I loved how he does these literary exercises where some of these persona are just literary exercises, which to me just rings so true of something that an artist would do. He would just be, and, and also, honestly, I was, I was in England recently for the DVS meeting and I, I toured Hampton, uh, Hampton court. And I was so overwhelmed by just honestly how it kind of was oppressive. Like it was so buttoned up and there's everything is so mannered and, you know, all these rules governing everything. And I was just trying to imagine what somebody like, you know, uh, Edward Devere, you know, this kind of manic bursting with life, like Robin Williams-esque persona would feel in that kind of an environment. And it just, it, you know, it was making sense that he would be just bursting with wanting to play all these pranks and make up all these people and have all these sock puppets and just basically raising hell because he's around people that are, you know, so constrained. Um, but anyway, my question was about the the literary exercises. Yeah, a lot of things he wrote were literary exercises. And some of those threw me off because I would say, this doesn't sound like our guy. You know, uh, Robert Greene, Planet of Machia, we talked about that earlier as an interesting example. And he's, he's this long essay, and it's not very well, not very exciting to read. And it has to do with planets, and, you know, there's some astrology in there, and this, that, and the other, and he's bringing in gods and stuff. And then... You, I, I came across a scholar who knew a lot more than I do about these things. And he said, oh, this is almost word for word from some Latin text from, you know, about 1500 years ago. And I was, oh, he's just translating it. it. It's not his opinion or Robert Greene's opinion. It's just literature. And he did that a lot. You know, um, Thomas Nash has a lot of things in there that sound exactly like another voice who's kind of a, a a, a prudish um, a Calvinistic type of guy. You don't realize how much of that is in Thomas Nash because people like to focus on his battle with great Gabriel Harvey and how clever he was. But he had a lot of griping about society that uh, you know you would you would hear from some you know buttoned down person. So he would mix these these uh, canons up a lot. Thomas Lodge is a very mixed canon. Hey, uh, to close, maybe I'll read you something about Thomas Lodge. Okay. He uh, he wrote these mellifluous prose pieces and beautiful poetry, and then he wrote a bunch of religious rants, and then Oxford dies, and uh, but Thomas Lodge keeps publishing a few things. He publishes a long translation of, of Josephus, which Oxford never would have done. And then he becomes a doctor. He goes to Paris to become a doctor. He's a complete quack. He writes a medical book that's absolutely horrifying to read and what he would be willing to do to people. But he also, in his final year, and think about Oxford in his final year. It's 1604. He's updating Hamlet. He's at the peak of his powers, okay? So now Thomas Lodge and 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 the, um, the scholars will tell you, yeah, he continued writing until 1622 when he wrote a poem uh, in, in Countess of... What's your name? Countess of Lincoln's Nursery was the name of the little book. Well, let me read you uh, his poetic address to the Countess of Lincoln. Four lines. Blessed is the land where sons of nobles reign. Blessed is the land where nobles teach their train. To church for bliss, kings, queens should nurses be. To state its bliss, great dames, babes, nurse to see. <laughs> it's two different people. There's no question about that. Mm. Dorothea, your question, and then I'll oh, write okay. a little bit of announcements and things, but you had a... Announcements, a all right. So to be a writer today, every writer not only has to produce the book, every writer needs to be their own marketer. And the place where writers market is on social media. And we have Twitter, X, we have independent websites, we have Instagram, we have Amazon, we have LinkedIn, we have Facebook, we have our own web pages, right? We have all of this. So my mind is trying to encompass what would Edward DeVere do if he had all of those capabilities and all of these voices, how would he market his work? Because the man was a master marketer. I mean, not only a master writer, he was a master self-promoter and marketer. Well, he had two venues to promote himself. One was Paul's Churchyard, of course. And there's a really cute little line 
in Thomas Nash where he's hiding from his enemies. And he says, he says, you'll never find me. He said, the next time you find me, it'll it'll be at Paul's churchyard. In other words, I, I'm just books. Uh, and the other place, of course, was the stage. And I think that's where he created by far the most delight. And anybody who'd seen one Edward de Vere play and heard there was another one coming in two months, just wouldn't miss it. But as far as what he would do today, I don't know. I would ask Phoebe. Oh, me. I'm trying to throw it back to Bob because okay, I, okay. I, oh. I heard someone say we need. <laughs> well, I, I got totally don't... distracted because I saw somebody say we need to challenge Bob more or something. Because <laughs> and I, I don't want people to go home feeling like we we softballed Bob. So that's that's where my mind went. Softball. He threw the. He threw a pretty good curveball there. There's so much more to explore. You know what? We're, we're getting, yeah, that's, I'm that's hearing that's tons of feedback saying we need part two of this. So cool. hey, maybe we can tear into you then and destroy it. No, I'm kidding. It's going to take me another year just to dive in deeper yeah, and read more of your stuff, uh, Bob. It's fascinating. But uh, yeah, just, people are loving this. I'll leave you with a picture. So you're, you're me and you're flipping through the Thomas Lodge canon and you get to Euphuie's shadow. Now, why would another guy write about Euphues when he was out of uh, style by then. Well, Oxford still loved Euphues. And here's the first page of the dedication. I'm hoping that you can see it. Can you see the first word? Can mm. you read it? We can't quite read it, or at least I can. It's, it's, it's ever giant, but it's illustrated really big. It's a giant E and then a capital V-E-R. Oh. Okay, I have a better answer to the question That's before, which is what would, how would a master marketer wrap up? And I think a master marketer would wrap up by plugging plugging the book or asking Bob, how can people Somebody find say, out more? What's the name of the book? Oh. Oxford's Voices. And where do we get yeah. it? Yeah, I, mean, I tell you what, if you can go to oxfordsvoices.com, no apostrophe, of course. And there's a pile of free stuff there. Just scroll down to the bottom of the page, and there's there's essays, there's explanations, there's print stuff, there's videos, um, Q and A's, and there's so much there. I mean, that could probably keep you occupied for a weekend or two right there. And if you decide it's not for you, you'll know it. And uh, I mean, that's where I would start. And then, if people are intrigued, they can go on and, and buy the book well I'll just you know click the button and, and they can order it there i think i think we're charging 97 dollars, and you know that's probably more than most books if you look at it in that point of view but since uh it's the equivalent of about 20 books i think it's more like four dollars and 90 cents a piece <laughs> so it's pretty cheap but if anybody has any any um financial issues they can just email info at oxfordvoices.com and 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 plead poverty and and you know i'll be happy to see what i can do and to be fair, we're taught we're saying book, but it's a virtual online book. It's not. Yeah, really, I kind of call it it's more like a library. It's a bit more like a library. Right, <laughs> and it's a living book. Well, Bob <laughs> likes feedback, right? Bob, you want other people. You want people to read it to challenge you to to get into the weeds and to kind of figure out how it can be improved before it's frozen. I would love for people to. And in fact, I say that right in the intro. If you find anything, any fact that you think is wrong. Um, please tell me because I want to fix it. And while it's a live book, I can do that. Uh, there has there has been a bit of fixing, um, quite a bit of expansion, uh, because people would you know challenge an idea. Say you know let me look into that, and I would I would expand it a little bit. Um, but I love having it as a living book. It's it's only gotten better, which is good. Um, so and I'm wide open. I'm not one of these people that tries to protect you know what I've done. If I sense for a second that I made a mistake. I want to dive into it and fix it. Um, so if you find something, let me know. Well, as I say, I hear lots of feedback around the room. We want a part two of this. So hopefully we'll be able to drag <laughs> back here and I'll give you a free bowl of pretzels to eat at the bar. Um, <laughs> okay. And thank you, Bob. It's been great having you here. It's been great fun, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. And thank great. you, thank you Jonathan. You're, you're a great bartender and a great thank host. And, and despite being your bar for this long, I don't, I, I can't feel any any effects. Unlike us, I didn't see you Under sipping. Your, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Oh, I knew it. Somebody always forgets their keys.
There you go. Well, it was nice having you. I hope you enjoyed what you saw. If you liked it, again, uh, give us a like or a subscribe there at the tip jar at your table. And uh, if you want to learn more all about this, go to the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship website. Just look them up and you'll find tons more information on everything Edward Vere and Shakespeare. It's been great having you. Safe drive home. Take care.